Got your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 40, <clears throat> we'll not read the whole chapter, we'll go through the entire chapter as we move along tonight, but let me give you the first verse, chapter 40 verse 1, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. The entire chapter, chapter 40, let me back up and just say this. Many times, verses are somewhat taken out of context. And if you are familiar with Isaiah chapter 40, there's an extremely famous verse at the very end of the chapter in verse 31. You know it, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. But from verse 1 to verse 31, the context of the chapter is laid out very plainly and very, and very uh, clearly. God said, comfort yourself. Take comfort. Take comfort in what I'm about to tell you. And so tonight I just want to preach to you a message entitled, Take Comfort. I like messages like this. Oh, don't get me wrong. I, uh, I preached about salvation sin this morning. Nothing wrong with that. But when you preach in a series, I, I just like messages about comfort. I want to give you five things that I found here in this chapter tonight that as we see the day approaching, the day of that trumpet blowing, between now and that point, take comfort. It's all good, amen? It's all good. And uh, it's going to be okay. You know, we can, when, if you know the outcome, listen, you can endure it. Uh, my mom and I, was, when I was a kid, used to force feed me green peas and carrots. I dislike green peas and carrots to this day. But I'd get a couple spoonfuls down because there's chocolate pudding waiting on the other side. Now sometimes you just got to, you know, you can get through the green peas and carrots if you know there's chocolate pudding waiting on the other side. Now you can put any analogy in there you want. Well, let's have a word of prayer. And we're going to go through this chapter very quickly tonight. But I want to tell you, in this chapter... If you'll get a hold of these things, you can take comfort no matter what's going on in your life. No matter what the political realm may be. Even if you had COVID, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. We can all get through it. We can all take comfort tonight. Amen? Heavenly Father, God, we love you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house again. Thank you for the opportunity to preach. Thank you for these, Lord, our church family, uh, with their health and those that are still healing, those that are traveling, working, whatever the case may be, Lord, keep them safe. Give them their health. Give them rest until the next appointed time. Now we ask all these things in your precious holy name. Amen. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. I found five different things in this chapter or if you will, I broke the chapter down in five different parts. And the title or the tone of the book, of the chapter, 
is very clearly stated in verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Now there's a lot there. Number one, take comfort, but not just anybody take comfort. God said to His people, take comfort. His people. And, and if we were to just stop and look at that for a minute, we need to understand that if we're a child of God, a child of God, we ought to take comfort. But too many times Christians tend to come unwound. All right, we, we live in fear or we're more afraid of uh, the circumstances of the day and time or, or things that are going on than we do fear God. But he tells us right away, take comfort. Now the first thing I want you to see is in verses 2 through 5. He says, he goes on to say, Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. She hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord, now watch, shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now some of y'all didn't understand that because if you did, you would have amened. Well, let me tell you, you can take comfort in the promise of knowing that Jesus is coming again. That's the first and most important thing you need to understand tonight. You need to understand and take comfort in knowing Jesus is coming. The trumpet's going to sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we're going to see Jesus face to face. And the song, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Him. Oh, my stars, the promise of His coming. Take comfort in knowing that Jesus is coming. Can you imagine if, if you didn't know that Jesus was coming and all we had to do is look forward to tomorrow? Have you seen the news yet today? Jesus is coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His works. Matthew 24, 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Titus 2, 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The first thing we can take comfort in is knowing that Jesus is coming. Then I go on to read through the chapter. Look at verse 6 through 11. The voice said, what is the voice? That voice that's crying in the wilderness. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now, that's kind of key in the context. And I believe that we can take that, and obviously it's been preached this way that the heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord will never pass away. It stands forever. But another way of looking at it in this context is, is that God's promises are true. They never fail. And so as we continue to read, we see some of this here. 
in verse 9, O Zion, that bring us good tidings, and get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings. Lift up thy voice uh, and with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come. Now watch. The Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with the young. By the way, that's a promise. That's a promise. The promise is, is that one day, Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to, now watch, he's going to deliver his people. He's going to take care of his people. He's going to feed his people. It's a promise. So while heaven and earth passes away, you can take comfort in knowing that when God said it, it's going to come true. God will deliver his people. He will feed his people. He will take care of his people. Psalm chapter 34, verse 17 the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Psalm 107, 6, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Psalm 50, 15, And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Second Samuel 22, 2, And he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Take comfort in knowing that Jesus is going to come back. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to deliver us from the troubles of this world. Let's show you the next part here. Look in verses 12 through 18. <clears throat> Boy, this is good. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and metered out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted in the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles, and as a very little thing. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beasts that are sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing, and vanity. Notice one more verse. To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? Who is more superior than God? Now stop and think about that. Who, who can hang the stars in the sky? Who can speak worlds into existence? Who carves out the rivers and the lakes and the oceans? Who created wildlife? Who gave you life? Who breathed into man the, the, and, and gave him the breath in his nostrils, the breath of life? Who did that? God did that. God and God alone, he is superior in all his ways. He's sovereign. He is a supreme in his leadership in everything that he does. He cannot be outdone. Nothing can compared to him. Sometimes I'm so amazed at some of these uh, other religions and doctrines and heathenistic ways, but none of them compare to what God can do. First Chronicles chapter 29 verse 11 says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine, Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Who is that? It's God. God does that. Oh, wait, we can take comfort. Now watch. 
We take comfort in knowing that He's coming. We can take comfort in knowing that when He comes, He will deliver us and provide for us. And not only will He deliver us and provide for us, He's not just any provider. He's not Walmart. The one who's coming back again and going to deliver us and provide for us is the one who created all things. He's superior. Take comfort in that. As I continue to look down through the chapter, look at verse 19. The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over the over it. I'm sorry. The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he, that he hath no oblation chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Look at verse 21. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Hath ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretched out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not uh, take root in the earth, and he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? In other words, God is not a graven image and an idol. God is not something that man can create. I like the idea that man is like a grasshopper. God can just blow on man and he can wither and rot and die. The very breath of God, when he blows on humanity, take you out. Forget throwing a punch at you. But we can take comfort in the promise of His coming, knowing that when He comes, He's going to deliver deliver us, provide for us. And He's not just anybody. He's sovereign and supreme. He's the one who created the heaven and earth. But notice this. We can take comfort in the promise of knowing that He is not just any God. He's not just some graven image. He's not just something that man puts up on a shelf and worships. He's the King of kings and He's the Lord of lords. We can take comfort in knowing that the one that's coming back for us to deliver us, to deliver us with all supreme and sovereign ruling, He's King of kings, and he's Lord of Lords. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of Lords. Revelation 19, 16, he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 1, 8, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come the Almighty. Revelation 21, 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Revelation 22, 13, I'm Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Oh, let me tell you something. We can take comfort in knowing that when Jesus comes, he's coming back as king. King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, let's continue to look down here. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might. For that he is strong in power, not one faileth. You know, not one thing God created that ever fails. You know, it's not like you put a star up in the heaven and went, oh, that's a dud. 
God never, in all of God's creation, it was perfection. Verse 27, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest over Israel, My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that hath no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now I know that verse is quoted often, and it's quoted often in and of itself. But if you read the previous verses prior to that, it's a, there's this understanding that God doesn't faint. God doesn't weary. God, matter of fact, the God, the strength and the power that God has never weakens. You know, if, we, if you were to just put a simple tin can of green beans or corn in your hand and just start walking around with it doing this, sooner or later your arm's going to get tired. You know what the idea of this is? That in all of humanity, every one of us here, God knows your weaknesses. And he's able to carry you in his hands. And not one minute does he weary, tire, or weaken. It's an interesting idea. That we can take comfort in the promise of his coming. And not just his coming, but we can take comfort in knowing that when he comes, we're going to be delivered from this old world. And not, not just knowing that we're going to be delivered from this old world, but we're, be, we're being delivered by someone who is superior in everything that he does. He's sovereign, and he's our supreme leader. And not just that, but we can take comfort in knowing that when he comes, he'll be king of kings and lord of lords. Now watch this. But having said all that, we can take comfort in all of those things. All of that is preempt to this last section. Because we know all that's coming, Okay, now watch. Because we know all that, and you got to know all that. Because we know all that, you can have strength to endure this life. He says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I don't know about you, but if I start running from here to the house, I'm going to be wore out by the time I get there. Now, Caleb, he's a runner. He's got to run. He's in shape. I, it wasn't too long ago where he, uh, I said something about him going on his weekend uh, training, and he just kind of said, ugh, it was a weekend you had to run. And that's just about, I think, all he did. They just ran. Uh, so he, I know he's, he's in a lot better shape than I am. He can run. Some of us, you and I, we take a couple steps and we're worn out. Now, I don't think God's talking about phys a, a physical running. He's talking about a spiritual race. He's talking about a race that we can run. Uh, Paul said, I've, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. The idea is to finish. The idea is to not quit. The idea is to keep our faith. The idea is to not get discouraged. Uh, I was reading uh, in Hebrews where the Bible says, Forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together, as we, as we, but, but rather exhorting one another, as we see the day approaching. Exhorting means to uplift, to be encouraged, to, to be excited, 
to be happy. Because guess what? As we see the day approaching, times are not going to get better. So the idea here is, is that we don't get discouraged and we don't weary and we don't let the things of this world pull us down and get us into a point and place where we slow down, now watch, where we slow down in regards to serving the Lord. We need to stay active, we need to stay busy, and we need to stay in the race. Don't quit. But we can take comfort in knowing. When I was at high school, I... My junior year, I blew my knee out playing football. And it was a really sad day because I was on my way to play in the NFL. That's a joke, by the way. It's not. I was at best second string going into my senior year. And I I blew the ligaments out in my knee. And so we moved and we moved uh, to a new city. And that's bad enough because you just don't walk on to kids that have been playing all their life. So I had to run cross country. I didn't have to. I chose to run cross country. And uh, that was the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. Because there's a reason why they call it cross country. But the one thing, cross, when I, when I well, the first day of practice, coach said, you ever ran cross country? I said, nope. I said, what do I need to know? He said, now watch. He said, Finish. all he said I said so and he looked at me he goes Mark your neck look and he was honest he said you're never going to win a race and he started pointing out kids and giving me times of kids I said Mark you ain't never you're not that fast he said the best thing watch this he said the best thing you can do is finish the race because everybody that crosses the finish line we get points for It's when you don't finish the race. He said, I cannot emphasize. It's important that you never, never, never quit. And I remember running cross country. I forget, I think it's seven miles, five miles, something like that. We up the hill and down the mountain and through the woods and through the water. And I remember going back up the mountain thinking, this is dumb. I, this is dumb. I don't know. This is not fun at all. When your legs are burning, and sweating, and people are passing me up. And we've got to the top of the hill, and I'm not lying. You want to quit. And you take a turn through the trees. I remember taking the turn, and you came out of the trees, and you could look down, and you could see the finish line. And as long in the watch, as long as I could see the finish line, every step got me a little closer. Here's what happens to us in our Christian life. We get discouraged by the things of this life. And we lose sight of the finish line. And if I could put it this way, if I could just put it this way, God wants us to keep our eyes on the finish line. Because as long as we can see the end, we can take comfort. What happens is, and it's the same concept all through Scripture, Jesus and Peter, Jesus walking on the water, Peter said, let me come to you. He steps out of the boat. But as soon as Peter took his eyes, watch, as soon as he took his eyes off Jesus, now watch, and I'm done with this. Verse, verse, chapter 40, he says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Take comfort. Comfort in what? Comfort in knowing that I'm coming back. 
Not only am I coming back, but when I come back, take comfort in knowing that I'm going to deliver you from this world. I'm going to take care of you. Not just take care of you, but when I come and come back to take care of you, I'm coming back with supremacy. I'm coming back as boss. And not only am I coming back with supreme and sovereign and superior leadership, but I'm coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. And take comfort in that. And you can take comfort in that and find strength. Now watch. If you'll just wait on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the finish line and take comfort. Take comfort in knowing it comes right back again, full circle, that he's coming again. I don't know if that makes any sense tonight. But take comfort. Take comfort. Hey, listen, I, I, don't, I wish I could tell you times are getting better. I just don't see that they are. But that doesn't mean that we as Christians can't be comforted. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we as Christians can't find joy. Just keep our eyes on the finish line. And all God's people say, stand to your feet.